Hello and welcome. Uh, we are continuing on our lecture series into chapter 18. Uh, this is coming from the Stats Modeling the World curriculum by Pearson Education. And uh, this is an introduction to sampling distribution models. It's our first, uh, first chapter in, in what is considered kind of the last section of the AP Statistics curriculum. Uh, and it's sort of an introduction to uh, inference. And what we mean by inference, or at least how I always call inference, it's uh, making decisions using data. And uh, so throughout this curriculum, we've had a lot of looking at data and doing good experiments. Uh, but this last step is sort of an essential part of our of our journey through statistics, uh, introduction to statistics, um, because these last tools that we'll be using here are going to allow us to make decisions um, about the data that we're looking at. Uh, and critical to that understanding is these things called sampling distribution models. They are the foundation for which all inference works. Uh, so it's very important that you understand the concepts of this chapter. Um, not necessarily maybe the problems, quote unquote, that we do in this chapter, um, but how the models work and uh, how they will uh, apply to our future when talking about uh, these things called confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. Uh, it is essential to understanding those. So uh, let's go ahead and just get started in talking about uh, what a sampling distribution model is. Uh, so we have this thing called the central limit theorem uh, for sample proportions. We also do it for uh, quantitative data, uh, which that would be um, for like means. Uh, this is for categorical data, right? When I say proportions, we should be thinking categorical data, like percents. Uh, so rather than taking um, a bunch of samples, right? Rather than doing experiment after experiment after experiment um, and, and, and using all of that data, uh, we can imagine what would happen if we were to actually draw that many. Uh, we can create uh, models that will predict if we were to have that many samples. Uh, what would the sample proportion for these samples look like? So I take lots and lots of samples, right? And I come up with a proportion. And then I take a look at those proportions and I make another proportion out of that one. What would that look like? Uh, the histogram we'd get is we could see all of these proportions um, from all possible samples is called the sampling distribution of the proportions. So the difference here in this sort of key word is the sampling distribution is not one set of data. It is the distribution we get if we were to take the proportion of many sets of data. So let's take a quick example of that. Uh, so again, what would this histogram look like uh, if we were to do that? Um, let's uh, take a quick second to look at some data that we've collected in class. Uh, we have here, and this was done, uh, this was done uh, in class, uh, the class that I teach here. Uh, this is some, this was looking at tax. So I had uh, 19 students, excuse me, 18 students take thumbtack and flip it like they flip a coin, okay? Um, and had them record how many times they went tax side up and tax side down. You can see from looking at uh, the sum of these two things, they flipped it 30 times, okay? And then we recorded our proportions over here. So this set of data, which is all uh, right over here, right, is the proportions that the students got. Uh, and you can see that they vary pretty significantly, right? Uh, it goes down as low as 40%, I think 47% is the lowest, no, 36% is the lowest. Um, it gets as high as 87%. Okay, so we had a, some people go really high up, we had some people go a little bit farther down, but the average that we found, if we take all of these things, add them up, we ended up with an average of 61%. Okay, 61% of the time it landed tax side up. Okay. Uh, by the way, the reason why we did it with tax instead of flipping coins is we expect coins to be 50%, but a lot of you probably didn't know what the probability of flipping a tax was, so we wanted to do something non-intuitive. Uh, so we got this data, okay? 
this is a distribution. This right here is a distribution of categorical data. We did one set of data multiple times and we found a proportion. Now what I'm talking about with the sampling distribution is imagine that we were to repeat this process, flipping a thumbtack 30 times eight, with 18 different people and finding more and more averages, okay? So we did this again, right? The same 18 students, they flipped these and we came up with a bunch of data, 72, 63, 51, 53, 41, 36, 82, and I'm just making up numbers. I didn't actually do this, right? Um, but we could if we wanted to. These are potentially, uh, these numbers are not like, you know, out there of what it could possibly be. We're still seeing some variation. Um, but uh, this is, you know, another potential distribution. And maybe we get like a 60%. I'm not actually going to calculate that. Um, but just as an example, we do this process over and over and over again. And we keep seeing. Um, different percentages, right? Uh, and we do this over and over and over and over again. We keep finding more and more of these. And then we take all of these numbers and we create a histogram of that. And sort of the purpose of this chapter is to help you guys understand that when we do this, when we uh, repeat this sort of experiment over and over and over and over again, and we take these numbers and make a histogram, uh, we're going to get something that looks vaguely normal. And it's going to have a center here at P, what we think the sample proportion is, and then it's going to have a standard deviation, and we're going to talk about what that standard deviation is as well. But this is what we're talking about as a sampling distribution. And it is an incredibly powerful tool um, because it allows us to look at a set of data that we found, right? This particular case right here that we did, and it allows us to say, how unusual is this? How unusual is it that we would get this sample proportion when we looked, when we did this set of data? And that's a really, really powerful idea because maybe you've got a friend. I don't have any, but maybe you do. Uh, maybe you've got a friend and he says, when you flip a thumbtack, there's a 55% chance that it's going to land tack side up. And then we would have to look at our sampling distribution and be like, well, friend, who's not in AP statistics, uh, we performed this experiment and created a histogram, and we found a sampling proportion of uh, 59%. And then we could say, if your 55% is true, there's only a 1% chance that we would have gotten 59%. So you know what? I think you're probably wrong, right? That's the idea of inference. That's what we're doing with inference. We're going to be able to say, listen, the 55% that you claim has an incredibly low percentage of happening based on this data that we took. And so we're going to say there's a low likelihood of that happening, so we think, we think that that's incorrect. Okay, That's a very simplified way of saying it, but that's what we're essentially moving towards here with these sampling distributions. It's a very powerful idea. It is really central to everything we do in statistics. Um, and it's really cool to be able to, to, be able to make those kind of... Uh, those kind of guesses, all right? Uh, so let's let's go back to the PowerPoint here and let's delve a little bit deeper into what we're talking about um, and some of the setup, right? Some of the things that we need to know before we can do it. So, oh my gosh, we got to get rid of those things. Okay, there we go. Uh, so, go back. Stop it. There we go. Uh, okay, we still didn't go back. So the next slide here. Um, we would expect the histogram of the sample proportions to be centered at the true proportion P in the population. Uh, we covered that already. Um, where, and as far as the shape of the histogram goes, we can simulate a bunch of random samples that we didn't really draw. Turns out it's unimodal and symmetric and centered at P. We kind of talked about that already. More specifically, it's amazing and fortunate, right? The fact that a normal model is just the right one for the histogram of sample proportions. Um, 
because we know lots of things about normal models. And like I was already saying, modeling how sample proportions vary from sample to sample is one of the most powerful ideas we see in this course because it allows us to make decisions. Um, and a sampling distribution model for how a sample proportion varies from sample to sample allows us to quantify that variation in how likely it is that we'd observe a sample proportion in any particular interval, right? That's what I was saying when we're looking, we're, we're looking at that claim of 55%. We can quantify how likely it is of, that our observation would occur if some, given that something else is true. Very powerful idea, okay? Um, to use a normal model, we need to specify its mean and its standard deviation. Uh, we'll put the mean as P, like we said in that uh, other, that when we were looking at that data, the mean is going to be centered at P. The standard deviation, however, is going to be a little bit different. When working with proportions, knowing that mean gives us the standard deviation. And there's our standard deviation right there. It is the square root of P times Q divided by N, where P is the proportion um, uh, I'm going to say proportion of success. That's how often something uh, occurs that it, that we're looking at. Like this would be the tax side up. Uh, Q is the proportion of failure. Uh, in terms of our thumb tack, that would be back, uh, tax side down. Um, and N is the sample size. So our normal model... Uh, that we would be using is this. The remember how we when we when we put the models together, uh, the n out here indicates that it's a normal model, uh, and then this is the mean and the standard deviation of that model. Uh, so I, if I were to write n of uh, 5.2 comma 1.1, that means it has a mean of 5.2% and a standard deviation of 1.1. And we have a picture of that right here. Okay, this is a normal model that is centered at P. And remember, if I take one standard deviation times the square root of PQ over N, that tells me what number this is. Um, two times that would be here, three times that would be here. Again, uh, if that we had that N is 5.2 comma 1.1, that means that this is 5.2, and this is 1 times 1.1, and this is 2 times 1.1, 1 .1, um, excuse me, plus 5.2 plus that, and then 5.2 plus that, and then 5.2 plus that. Uh, and it works in the opposite direction as well. Going into the negatives, we have the negative standard deviations below the mean. Um, and also, everything that we know about normal models uh, Z scores, right? The number of standard deviations away from the mean. All of that applies to this model, uh, which is one of the wonderful reasons uh, why it's great that we know th that, it's, that the normal model works. Because all those things we've learned about the normal model will apply here. So again, if we have a normal model of 5.2 comma 1.1, we are not surprised that 95% of normally distributed values are within two standard deviations of the mean. Because remember our empirical rule, right? That we have one standard deviation away is 68%, and that two standard deviations away is 95%. So this allows us to see, again, we're talking about rarity. Uh, if I know that 5.2 is my uh, my mean, and I have a standard deviation of 1.1, uh, a value like 7.3 is very, very rare, incredibly rare, because it's three standard, it's almost three standard deviations away from the mean, and that means that, uh, excuse me, uh, that 99.7 approximately uh, is, uh, observations are within those three standard deviations. So finding an observation out here, very, very rare occurrence. So the fact that it's a normal model, super nice, because we know lots of things about normal models, and that allows us to make decisions. Um, we should also not be surprised if 95% of various polls gave results 
that were near the mean, but varied above and below by no more than two standard deviations. And this is what we really mean by sampling error. Um, again, keyword, vocabulary there, sampling error. It's not really an error at all, right? Error sort of seems to imply mistake. It's not a mistake, right? It's variability that you'd expect to see from one sample to another, right? So instead of calling it sample or error, the, probably the better way to call it would be sampling vari variability. But when you watch news shows, they always call it sampling error, right? With an error of, uh, you know, 5% or whatever they, whatever they say. Error is the wrong word, word because it implies that it's wrong, right? That's, that's not what we mean by error. What we mean is variability. That the my mean is 5.2, but there's a variability in there that would be between, uh, 7.4 and uh, I'm trying to do math in my head here, right? Which is always a bad thing. 3.0. Oh, so this is actually, and I'm just thinking about this. This is two standard deviations away from me. Let's change that to 83 percent. So that's more right. Anyway, um, so this is a this is sampling variability. The better a better term for it. Okay. Um, and then finally, so how good is this normal model? Um, normal model gets better. As, uh, as a distribution of sample portions, as the sample size gets bigger. Um, if we only have one sample, the normal model is not fantastic. But when we have more and more samples, the more samples we have, uh, the, the better and more accurate it is, up to a point. Okay? And we're going to talk about those things and all of those requirements in our next video. We're going to close it off here for now. Um, this is just an introduction to what sampling distributions are. Uh, in the next video, we will be talking about the assumptions and conditions that we need assumptions um, and conditions that we need to meet uh, in order to use a sampling distribution. And we will also be doing a few uh, problems, maybe I should say uh, exercises, right? Um, I'm not going to say exercises because I don't know how to spell it. Uh, so we're just going to say some problems. We're going to do a couple of problems, quote unquote problems, uh, that use the sampling distribution. But that's what we have for now, and we will see you another time. Thank you.